A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar organized by the National University of Singapore's Center for International Law on the 2020 US presidential election, titled The Next Four Years, The Impact of the US Presidential Election on International Law and Relations in Asia. We are extremely grateful this morning to have with us an esteemed panel, led by our moderator, Professor Simon Chesterman, Deputy Chairman of the Center for International Law's Governing Board and Dean of the NUS Law School. There will be a QA and a session at the end of today's webinar, so please feel free to type your questions using the Q&A function at any time. I will now be handing over to Professor Chesterman to kick off the webinar. Professor Chesterman, please. Thank you very much, Joel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you've got your coffee. I've got mine handy, and uh, welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. Uh, so, as Joel said, the title is "The Next Four Years: The 2020 U.S. Presidential's uh, Presidential Elections Impact on International Law and Relations with Asia." Uh, and I must begin with an apology that I am not Tommy Ko, uh, and uh, so Tommy sends his regrets. He's unable to take part this morning, uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to a rich discussion with our esteemed panelists, but also with all of you. Uh, we know we've got uh, over 100 people already logged in, some others will be joining us. Uh, so do please uh, start writing your questions in the Q&A function, uh, and we will get to them presently. Um, but first, I do want to give brief introductions to our panel. Um, we have uh, with us uh, Nirmal Ghosh, uh, who is the US Bureau Chief for the Straits Times, who's based in Washington, DC. I don't think that's a live picture behind him, but uh, it sets the tone for where he's coming from. Uh, we've got Tina Dutta, who is the head of the Republican Republicans Overseas, uh, based in Singapore. Uh, Steve Okun is a senior advisor at McLarty Associates and a former deputy general counsel in the Clinton administration. Uh, and I have two colleagues from NUS, Kanti Bajpai, who is the director of the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, and Simon Tay, who's a colleague in the law school, as well as being chair of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Now, it's a truism for all of us who pay attention to US politics. Uh, many, like myself, have spent time in the US. I lived there for six years. Uh, it's a truism that we're immensely interested, uh, but often we overstate the importance of international relations to US domestic politics. Uh, many of us around the world think that we should have a vote almost uh, in the US presidential election because it has an impact on all of us. But many of us also overestimate how important foreign policy is to the average American voter. Uh, insofar as foreign policy featured in this campaign, it wasn't always particularly edifying, sometimes coming down to just who was going to be tougher on China or who was in whose pocket uh, in terms of allegations of corruption. When we were scheduling this webinar, we had no idea how timely it was being. I was going to be. I, I kind of joked with the organizers that, oh, six days after the election, do you think there'll be a result by then? Uh, we had no idea that it would be quite so close, that it's only just over 24 hours uh, since most of the serious news outlets called the election for Joe Biden. Uh, and it's a little over 12 hours uh, since the Singapore's prime minister and president uh, have uh, congratulated Joe Biden on becoming the 46th president of the United States. Today, we will be focusing on the international law dimensions and in particular, uh, the question of what this means for US relations with Asia. Uh, and so I'd like to get straight into it, beginning uh, with Nirmal, who's been following this, I think on a daily basis, much closer than the rest of us in terms of trying to keep track of both the election, but also offering for readers of the Straits Times and other outlets, uh, a, a sense of what this might mean for Singapore and for Asia. So Nirmal, if I can turn to you to start off with, could you give us an update on the electoral and the legal situation and what sort of first impressions you have of the foreign policy and defense security uh, implications this is going to have uh, for those of us either living in or interested in Asia? Nirmal, over to you. Well, that's, that, that would require a, a very long answer. But anyway, um, the legal situation, there's a, there's a raft of lawsuits being filed and in the process of being filed in several states. Uh, but uh, the legal experts one speaks with do not expect much to come of them. In some, to some degree, it's, a, it's about political theater to sort of signal that you know, there's something fishy going on out there and so forth. However, nobody that knows President Trump is willing to actually 
write him off entirely. So, uh, you know, it, it, there is still a, a lot of drama ahead, unfortunately. And um, to sort of maybe look at, say, policy towards the Asia Pacific, have you sort of forecast a Joe Biden administration, which, which is um, seems to be uh, really the reality going forward? Uh, there will be more continuity than change towards the Asia Pacific, but a shift in tone. Uh, the US will still be sharply divided at home. A lot depends on the degree of that division and how it evolves. But Joe Biden is inheriting a country with growing anti-China sentiment. There is a bipartisan consensus, yes, that China is the strategic threat. But the uh, Trump administration has to a degree demonized China, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Simon. That's one factor to watch. How is that managed? Uh, a Joe Biden uh, presidency cannot be seen to be soft on China. And why would he be if the US considers it impossible to sort of share the planet, so to speak, with a peer competitor? Uh, he would be inheriting a larger military footprint from uh, President Trump, which is not a bad thing. It puts a muscle into the pivot to Asia, and it would not make any sense to reduce it. But the question remains, how do they manage to coexist? Can a Joe Biden administration carve out areas to work with China where required, particularly on um, existential threats, climate change, transnational threats, organized transnational organized crime, health and pandemics? Is it possible? And does the president of, of the United States, given the situation at home, deal from a position not just of strength, but of some moral authority? So um, going forward again, again, uh, sort of something which is we have to keep an eye on is the Democrats may not have control over the Senate. So that has been watched very closely. But one thing that has become obvious these past years is the president, especially working in sync with the Secretary of State, has, of course, a lot of power in foreign policy, virtually run from the White House. If we look at Jared Kushner's role, for example. So it's not that a President Biden wouldn't have the scope. Um, in terms of President Trump's instincts to withdraw from you know, never-ending wars, costly wars in remote areas, many feel it's it, you know, you, it's, it's a strong case, but his transactional approach, his seemingly transactional approach to keeping troops in regions where the US has long standing strategic interests, you know, Japan and South Korea in our context, that, that would likely be gone. And that is definitely a big deal, given that if they were to be withdrawn, which the president would like to do, draw down, draw them down at least, eventually Japan and South Korea, there's a high chance that both would become nuclear weapons powers down the road, eventually. Um, but you know, the good thing is that Joe Biden will have, at least according to the rumor mill here, he'll have a, a set of Asia veterans in the administration. And the idea is to re-engage, strengthen alliances, including with Japan, South Korea, and Australia. And, and the Quad is something which I find very interesting to watch. I think that would be really interesting to watch. And, and that sort of generally would be good for deterrence. He believes, Joe Biden believes in alliances of democracies. In fact, I discovered today that back when India carried out its nuclear tests, he went on record as saying it was not a great thing, but at least India is a democracy. So he believes in that sort of thing. He'll work on an alliance of democracies. They're looking at a global summit of democracies, one hears. Actually, not that dissimilar from what current administrations have been saying, but minus a sort of man-to-man -man megaphone diplomacy style of uh, President Trump. Uh, but, I mean, there's a giant caveat there. How many Asian countries will rush into this with, with open arms, right? That, that's the question. But anyway, um, there is uh, some hope for a definition of goals vis-a-vis -vis China. I mean, this, this administration does not seem to have defined the limits of competition. It has spoken about the Communist Party. It has spoken in, in regime change language without actually saying regime change. And that's not a very, uh, not, you know, be known it's not been a happy experience in any country. And then, of course, you have the question of North Korea and whether they can maybe work on an arms control deal. And then again, there the US would have to work with China. So I, I leave it there. I think, I mean, there's, there are other aspects which, you know, the WTO, I think uh, the US will work to reform the WTO. Um, and I'll wind up with, let me see if I can find the quote. Yeah. Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan, who will be familiar to all of us who cover Asia from the, the Obama 
years, they wrote in Foreign Affairs that, and I quote this, the goal should be to establish favorable terms of coexistence with Beijing in four key competitive domains, military, economic, political, and global governance. Um, so coexistence, but for that to happen also from the other sort of point of view, China also has to presumably curb some of its more um, aggressive or provocative behavior, whatever you may want to term it. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Many thanks, Nirmal. So I, I think you brought out some of the some of the really interesting tensions in the current moment because um, you, you didn't put it quite like this, but in the reaction to the presidential election, there is I mean, can, there's an element of Schadenfreude of people taking pleasure in some people taking pleasure in Trump's downfall, but the election of Biden and indeed Biden's candidacy was not really posited on radical change, but a kind of return to a degree of normality, the kind of institutionalism. The, the, the trust and faith in institutions that many people around the world or within the United States had sort of become used to. It's not make America great again, it's make America normal again. But against that, I think it is important to keep in mind that US relations with Asia have changed, that North Korea, when President Obama handed over to President Trump, President Obama said, look, North Korea is gonna be a, a very difficult problem to watch. Relations with China have changed completely. Uh, and indeed, if we go back to the sort of the Clinton administration of the 2000s, uh, that was the time when China was presented as the strategic, strategic partner. Uh, then the Bush administration repositioned that as the strategic competitor. Uh, and I think there's no, there's no doubt that um, uh, relations with China are more complex than they were back then. China is a very different country. China has uh, really emerged as a global power. Uh, so Tina, maybe if I could turn to you, um, could you talk a bit about how you see the evolving U.S. relationship with China uh, as someone who's been watching this very closely for, for some years now, uh, and in particular, perhaps the U.S. national security strategy, uh, where those who, those who praised Donald Trump, among other things, praised the fact that people now took American power a little bit more seriously than they used to, perhaps? Right. Well, um... I wanted to say, Nirmal, you've taken almost everything I was going to say, uh, and I really appreciate what you had to say because you are supporting quite a bit of what the current administration was doing in Asia. So I'm grateful for that. Um, I think it's probably a good idea if I was to give a little foundational information to our uh, to our participants, having a little history of how the United States has gotten to where they've gotten to, um, having to do with the position that the administration has taken and your mom's position that the Biden administration may take some of those same positions and move forward. Um, you know, the United States and the People's Republic of China established their diplomatic relationships in 1979. And the United States policy toward the PRC was primarily based on the hope that deepening engagement would spur fundamental economic and political opening of the PRC and lead to an emergence of a constructive and responsible global stakeholder with a more open society. Beijing um, openly acknowledges right now that it seeks to transform the international order to align with uh, the Ch China's uh, global interests. Uh, to respond to Beijing's challenge, the Trump administration adopted a competitive approach. And we can say whether we liked the competitive approach or we don't, but it was a change um, in dealing with China, taking a more um, competitive approach as more of a diplomatic approach. Even as we compete with the, the PRC, we welcome cooperation where our interests do align. And Nirmal said that. So I, again, um, am grateful for that. Competition doesn't need to confrontation or conflict. Uh, the United States has a deep abiding respect for the Chinese people and enjoys long standing ties with their economy. The United States expects to engage in fair competition with the PRC, uh, whereby both nations, businesses, and individuals can enjoy security and uh, pr pr I'm sorry about that, uh, pr prosperity. The United States is also building cooperative partnerships and developing positive alternatives with foreign allies, partners, and international organizations to support the shared principles of free and open order. Specific to the Indo-Pacific region, many of these initiatives are described in documents such as the Department of Defense June 2019 Indo-Pacific Strategy Report and the Department of State November 2019 Report on a Free and Mutually Aligned Vision. 
and approaches such as the South Asian, Southeast Asian nation's outlook on the Indo-Pacific region, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision, India's security growth for all of the region policies, Australia's Indo-Pacific concept, and the Republic of Korea's new Southern policy and Taiwan's new Southbound policy. One of the things that I think you guys would be interested in knowing, this information, if you look at these reports, does show the cohesive working of the United States with its allies and partners in Southeast Asia. And while these reports are not always made public to the, to, you know, across Asia, it's not that the United States has taken an individual position against China. And there, and as you mentioned, uh, per, you know, Professor Chesterman, um, the U.S. position is important, but it's also important that our allies in Asia come to a consensus with us as to the strategy to help work with China, um, help China advance in a constructive way, and also contain uh, China's outbound um, steps into, into ASEAN region. So I think from there, um, just talking about the defense strategy, I think Nirmal did a good job. I wanted to make a point that it's not just the United States individually that is, you know, approached China to make these changes. We are working with our global, our, our Asian partners, and they've come up with us their own strategies and reports towards a better um, Asian future uh, for, with, between the United States and China. Thanks very much, Tina. And I think you're you're right that if there's one thing that the Trump administration made abundantly clear to its its allies around the world, it's that you, they shouldn't just take the United States for granted. You know, President Trump was very direct in this, saying basically that uh, America was being taken advantage of. Um, but it's certainly true that many countries around the world relied on the U.S. security umbrella, uh, for example, uh, and uh, and that's true in Europe. It's also true in Asia. Uh, and one of the interesting questions is um, whether a Biden administration will reassert that role that was sometimes presented as, as the US as the guarantor of security worldwide. Uh, that's probably impossible. It probably never was possible. Um, but I, I appreciate the historical context that you've mapped out. Maybe just one thing that I would add is that um, in terms of the US-China relationship, I, I mentioned very briefly earlier the, the shift from the Clinton administration to the uh, Bush administration, around 2000, 2001, one of the big shifts was also that um, in the context of that shift from partner to competitor, uh, we then had the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States, uh, which really pushed China off the foreign policy agenda for some time. Uh, and this was actually yeah. completely in line with, with Chinese uh, desires, which was to keep a low profile. Um, Deng Xiaoping uh, famously had the, the idea of uh, Taoguang Yanghui, which essentially means hide your light under a bushel, uh, while China developed through the 2000s. Uh, and so although in early 2001 there was the beginning of a language of containment of China, the idea of containing China is no longer realistic. Uh, and so, Tina, I think, as, as you and Nirmal have highlighted, there is now this question of how you come to a modus vivendi between the US and China. Uh, and, Steve, maybe if I can bring you in on this, um, commenting, if you wish, on the security dimension, but also on the trade dimension, which I think is of particular relevance uh, to many of our uh, uh, attendees in this morning's uh, webinar. Could you talk a bit about how, how you see the US uh, evolving relationship with China, uh, both looking backward, but especially looking forward to, into a, a future Biden administration? Sure, Simon. And, and look, Donald Trump has, has been tough on China. The problem is Donald Trump has not been effective on China. Uh, he has done nothing but have a confrontational and a unilateral approach. And we've gotten nowhere on the core issues. I'll tell you, the thing that frustrated me the most uh, about all of this is when people would refer to it as Trump's trade war. And we were supposed to have this great master brand person in, in the White House, and yet it was branded as Trump's trade war. And it wasn't. Look, China started the trade war. And if you read what, you know, the Trump administration's, you know, Section 301 report on, on what underlied all the tariffs, it went through in great detail where China violated its commitments internationally in, in letter, if not in spirit, um, all of the aggressive actions it took, such as cyber theft, such as uh, forced technology transfer, such as not protecting intellectual property rights. And then you layer on top of that 
Made in China 2025, which is a massive state-driven industrial policy, which is aimed at keeping all of the 21st century issues within China from artificial intelligence uh, to green technologies and the like. And the Trump administration has failed in their policies to get China to address any of that, right? Made in China 2025 is still there. They just don't talk about it. Right, anymore. They haven't done anything in terms of market opening, um, because what has Donald Trump done? He's focused on the, the trade deficit. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Who cares if our trade deficit goes up or down? And it's actually gotten worse under, under Donald Trump with this phase one trade deal. We need to get to the phase two trade deal. And what, what Joe Biden has said is, look, I'm going to be tough on China, but I'm going to be tough but effective. I am going to get China to address all of those core unfair trade practices that the Trump administration correctly illuminated on, but never got addressed. And how is a Biden administration going to do that? It's going to do that through a multilateral approach. It's going to do that working through our allies, working with the EU, working with Japan, working with Australia, and of course, working with Singapore and, and other supportive nations in ASEAN. So this multilateral approach is going to be much more effective. And well, frankly, it can't be any worse, right? Because the Trump administration has not addressed the core issues that are facing trade when it comes to the business community. So that is what is going to be different about, about a, a, an approach in the, in the Biden administration. The second thing is Donald Trump is correct that there are times you need to confront China. You need to confront China on those unfair trade practices. You need to confront China when it comes to national security issues, you know, around, you know, 5G and, and, and other technology issues, but it can't be all confrontation. So a Biden administration says we're going to continue to confront China where it needs to be confronted, but we're also going to compete with them. And an example of that is putting more investment into Southeast Asia and, and across Asia so that we compete with China on Belt and Road that we don't cede all of the infrastructure investment to China. Now, countries like Japan are doing a lot. Australia is doing some. The US is starting to do some. It needs to do a lot more. So you're going to see that competition under a Biden administration. And you're also going to see collaboration. We, as you mentioned, the existential threats of, of, of climate change, of COVID, and future pandemics. And there are times when it is in the United States national interest and China's national interest for, for both of us to compete. So you're going to see competition. That is going to be very difficult because you're going to need to continue to confront China, but not have trade-offs where China says, well, we'll help out on climate change, but then you've got to give us on trade. You can't do that anymore. So it is going to be very difficult. This isn't going to be an easy thing to be tough, uh, but effective, but there is at least finally a strategy on how you can be tough, but effective as opposed to being tough without any strategy to get that done. And I would just say looking forward, while we certainly have got to a, a, a address the pandemic in the United States, the Trump administration has never had a national plan to address the pandemic. We're about to hit 10 million cases of COVID in the United States. We are getting a thousand people a day dying in the United States. There is no question that front and center, the Biden administration and the entire US government is gonna to have to have a national plan on COVID. That said, that doesn't mean that foreign policy is going to not be a, an issue at all or not be a priority. You're gonna see the Biden administration come back to Paris. It is going to strengthen NATO. It is going to come back to the WHO. Almost incomprehensible the United States would leave the WHO in the midst of, of the worst global pandemic in, in over a century. But that yet yeah, is what the Trump administration has done. So you're going to see a re-engagement in multilateral uh, fora. Um, so I do think you're gonna you're going to have some priority on on foreign policy. It's not going to just be address the pandemic, but of course the United States can't move forward uh, until it does. Um, and I would guess I'd close on this point. You're going to see a shift on on foreign policy to include not only development, as I had mentioned, you're going to see climate change is going to be a part of foreign policy and development, and human rights is going to be much more a part. Of, of foreign policy. I'll say the Trump administration did some recognition on, on upholding human rights. Look at the sanctions against, you know, Carrie Lam um, for what's happened to the Hong Kong protesters and the national security law in Hong Kong. But you're gonna see, you're gonna see a focus 
even more so on forced labor, could be with Xinjiang, but you see forced labor cases in Malaysia now um, with, with forced labor and plantations. You're gonna see forced labor being a focus on cocoa in Africa and child labor that happens there. So it is going to be a, a much more robust foreign policy that's not going to be this quote unquote American first, unilateral, it's a win, we win, you lose. It is going to go much, much beyond that. So a very interesting and hopefully opportunistic time to move forward from a, a Singapore, Southeast Asia, and Asia perspective as, as Vice President, uh, or I should say as President-elect Biden uh, soon becomes president in a couple months. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you kind of highlight these issues. I, I was candidly, I was about to make an observation that this is the first webinar I've almost made it to half an hour without talking about COVID, uh, which is one of the reasons we're having these webinars. Uh, and you're right that it was shocking to many people around the world that at a time of pandemic, we really would have normally looked to the United States for leadership in an area like this. And for that to be the moment when the US withdraws from the World Health Organization was um, surprising, let's say disappointing. Um, President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden has already said he will rejoin the Paris Accords. Um, but I might come back to you later on this question of whether there is still the degree of willingness and ability to engage internationally that the US previously had, because uh, the World Trade Organization, for example, uh, many observers have been critical of the US um, strangling of the appellate body, for example, by preventing uh, judges being appointed. Um, and it's, uh, it's worth pointing out that that started under the Obama administration. Um, also under the Obama administration, you had the spectacular uh, moment where China launched the Asia International Infrastructure Bank, uh, and President Obama called on allies around the world not to join as founding members. And I think with the exception of Japan, everyone did. So Britain, Germany, in our region, Korea, Singapore, Australia, uh, signed up as founding members. And so that I think was really seen as a moment where uh, the limitations of US influence were perhaps on display. Uh, and we'll come back maybe in discussion to say, to see whether uh, there's a prospect of um, enhanced influence or how the US will navigate that space. Um, but I want to turn now to, uh, to Kanti Bajpai, my colleague at, uh, at NUS, um, because uh, in addition to China, which is obviously extremely important, uh, another key player in, a in Asia is India. Uh, and you're a leading expert on India, including India's relations with China. Uh, and we were talking earlier before the webinar started that there's an interesting piece in today's New York Times uh, about celebrations in the village of uh, Tulasendrapuram in Tamil Nadu, uh, where Kamala Harris's grandfather was born. So much as Kamala Harris is uh, famous now as the first female vice president, the first female first vice president of color, um, she's being heralded in India as the first Indian descended, uh, uh, very senior leader in the United States. But at the same time, there's a degree of concern uh, about uh, what a Biden administration will mean for ties to India. Uh, given that much as Trump became tougher on China, uh, relations with India seem to have warmed up somewhat, partly because it, India offers a counterbalance to China, but also uh, it seems, at least anecdotally, uh, because of a degree of similarity in style between Narendra Modi's populism and President Trump's populism. Um, so, Kanti, could you talk a bit about the, the US-India relationship, touching on China as you see fit, uh, and, uh, and how you see this evolving under a Biden administration? Thanks a lot, Simon. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting moment. Um, I think that what I'm going to really say uh, uh, will address the kind of um, uh, advantages I think India sees dealing with Biden, um, uh, but also some of the, the potential difficulties. Um, I think it was mixed with Trump as well. Um, uh, as you said, uh, Trump was uh, very helpful in, in terms of a warm relationship with Modi. Uh, shared a kind of uh, a broad political style and, and tonality sometimes. Um, and of course, uh, was uh, very supportive of uh, India in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Quad was referred to earlier, and I think India's had its ups and downs on the Indo-Pacific and Quad, but has increasingly warmed up to it um, in light of uh, its difficulties with China, particularly uh, the border conflict this, uh, this summer. Um, but I think um, with Biden, um, there are three areas, at least, I think, where Delhi will be looking uh, for, you know, for, for some improvements um, um, and, and for a, maybe a, an easier and better fit. And the first one is, 
I think there's a sense that uh, Biden is very knowledgeable about foreign policy. I mean, one of the uh, rather wake up moments for Modi was when he engaged Trump and uh, Trump wasn't apparently aware that uh, India shared a border with uh, with China. And I think uh, nobody expects the, that kind of uh, uh, rather disarming remark from, from Biden. So they, they, they're going to expect Biden to be knowledgeable on foreign affairs and also to be very stable with allies. I think uh, uh, Trump had a habit of often being tougher with allies than uh, with adversaries, and this uh, unsettled India in the beginning as well. Uh, but I think um, with Biden, there's an expectation that it's going to be relatively uh, uh, stable uh, handling him and, and, and dealing with him. Um, the issue of, uh, uh, I think Biden's already flagged in the piece in foreign affairs, that, uh, and Nirbal mentioned that, that there's going to be a summit of democracies. That could cut a little bit both ways for, for India, which is having its ups and downs with democracy uh, in the Modi period. But broadly, I mean, I think India is comfortable with the idea of uh, a democratic alliance. So I think uh, Biden's knowledgeability, his, his stability with allies, and his underlining uh, democracy uh, lines up quite well for, for, for Delhi at this point. A second advantage, I think, is one that's been flagged, which is this kind of US return to international institutions. Um, India, under the new foreign minister, Jay Shankar, and under Modi, has been talking about you know, India as a leading uh, power, which is essentially India as a shaping power, trying to work with international norms and institutions to further India's interests. Um, so I think this idea of the United States returning to international institutions, the WHO, WTO, and, 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 and perhaps even regional institutions, I mean, this will, on balance, this will be music to to uh, Delhi's ears, particularly because uh, there was a feeling that uh, with the United States moving out of these institutions, China was sort of gobbling up that space. Uh, and so an American return is, is, is good for a, a return to balance. The third area which nobody's mentioned, but I think for India is quite important is uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, Biden signaled, uh, let's see if he's able to deliver, but I think you know, his, he'd like to go back to the deal. And I think that's good for India because India wants a strong relationship with Iran. It's had to move away from Tehran during uh, Trump's uh, time because of uh, the Trump administration's hostility to Iran. So I think uh, this is an area where uh, Delhi will be looking to uh, Biden to kind of uh, make things easier for Delhi vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Tehran. Three areas of difficulty, and I'll just stop there. I think the first one's been signaled already is the issue of human rights. I mean, Steve Oaken says it's going to be a return to that, a quite a robust stand on uh, human rights issues. Kamala Harris uh, has been uh, critical of India's Kashmir policy under Modi uh, since uh, August 2019, when uh, uh, he, he evoked uh, the special status of Kashmir in, in India's constitution. She's also been uncomfortable with the new Citizenship Act in India. So I think the first area where uh, Delhi will be wary is, uh, you know, the human rights angle. How far Biden's going to go with that, uh, especially with respect to India. Uh, I think uh, Delhi thinks that Biden, on the whole, will be a good friend, and uh, but there may be some uncomfortable moments there. Um, the second is trade. Um, Biden said that he will look for trade agreements, but will be cautious. He will emphasize things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, labor standards and environmental standards. Um, and I think um, there is a, a trade deal on, on the anvil with the Americans, uh, which has been held back because of this trend of the US election and a possible transition. So uh, I think Delhi will be looking to uh, Biden to reinvigorate those discussions, but be wary of the labor and environmental standards issues. Uh, um, but finally, I think the real issue is China. Um, to the extent that Biden is seen or, 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 or is softer on China. I think that in the midst of the border uh, conflict with China, which is ongoing for India, uh, a softer Biden approach will be a worry in Delhi. And I think, although Delhi hasn't said anything, uh, it's congratulated Biden and, and, and so on on the victory, uh, there will be you know, some disquiet there. Uh, also, Biden's, I think, um, uh, signal that he'll be tougher on Russia and Russia is very crucial for India diplomatically and particularly on arms sales. So I think a tougher policy on Russia might make Delhi uncomfortable as well. 
So I think, you know, overall, um, there's a kind of wait and see in, in Delhi at the moment uh, on how things will play out in the U.S. legally. Uh, what uh, They'll be watching very carefully to look at what Biden's national security team, foreign policy team, will actually look like. Uh, the first few weeks will be a tip off on how things are going to proceed. So I think they'll be watching that very carefully. But above all, uh, how Biden deals with China, I think, is going to be absolutely central to how India works with the new administration. So let me just stop there. Many thanks, Kanti. It really sort of calls back to what Nirmal was saying about the extent to which the incoming administration will be, in many ways, a known quantity. Uh, I was listening to a, a discussion uh, yesterday that um, I think President Biden and his presumptive team will come with more experience in Washington uh, than any administration, at least since LBJ. Uh, but as you're highlighting, Kanti, the world has changed. Uh, and so for all this experience and knowledge, uh, how that will be applied to the changing circumstances and the reality of the decline of American power, at least relative to China uh, and, and, and um, it, its place in the world, uh, is going to be a key challenge. Um, Simon Tay, can I, can I get your take on, uh, on two things that I know you followed very closely? One is um, the US relations and views of ASEAN and vice versa. Uh, but also a point that, that Steve and, um, uh, and Kanti to some extent have touched on, which is uh, the question of climate change and, and what it would mean to have the United States, I suppose, un unsign the Paris Accords. Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. I just want to, I will address those two questions about ASEAN and climate change. And I'll try and connect them a little bit to some of the things people have been saying about some of the American domestic imperatives, as well as the rules-based international order. Um, let me jump into it by saying first, I think a lot of what uh, Tina and Nirmal said echoed with me because uh, while Biden is the presumptive uh, president-elect, um, we must see that the elections have shown a very uh, divided and animated American politic polity. And Americans' issues at home will start to echo upwards. Uh, it will be a big question of how to deal with the pandemic, the economic crisis, and demonstrate that America is strong, confident, and that is the route to regaining respect and strength internationally. Because as you said, Simon Chesterman, uh, the reality is in that these last 10 plus years, the relative strength of China, China has come up. And we are perhaps again at the inflection point where if America does not recover, the relative strength of China will be reinforced and the rise of the others cannot be ruled out. So we really have to hope that American domestically must sort itself out before we think about its policies overseas. Um, the second point I'd make and focusing on ASEAN is that it's not been an easy four years for ASEAN. There is a deep current of American engagement in its corporates, its security, and that's continued. I mean, to give credit to America, America is a behemoth and that current, that consistency has been there even the last four years. But the last four years has seen kind of choppiness. Besides the current, the deep current, there's kind of a wave action. And on those turbulent waves, this orange bobbing ball uh, has been everywhere. Um, and the first year, he engaged Asia and ASEAN making the longest trip of any sitting president. But clearly, no policy vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN emerged. I must admit, I was a relative fan of the ASEAN uh, stance during the pivot years, where uh, the Obama regime administration really seemed to get ASEAN and understand how ASEAN worked, which is not easy, and how it might be useful in those multilateral engagements vis-a-vis -vis China, which Steve and others have talked about. In other words, if one is minded to deal with China in a multilateral way, to engage friends and allies in the region, one will come back to ASEAN. One will figure out that ASEAN's East Asia Summit, ARF, they're not perfect mechanisms at all, but they are there and they are useful in their own way. And sadly, the Trump administration from the Singapore Summit onwards has failed to turn up the very basic of diplomacy. Now, even if they did turn up, I think it's Steve O'Quinn's point about being able to offer some of the competitiveness in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative and infrastructure, you need to turn up with a credible uh, alternative. The Japanese are doing it, the Australians are trying, 
America returned to the table, not only diplomatically, but in substance, in de development, infrastructure, would be a critical one in engagement with ASEAN. But they had to be quite ginger about it. As my friend Bilahari Kausikan has made very clear, the last few years has given China so much scope in ASEAN that a push and shove might actually end up disuniting ASEAN, which is not good for ASEAN, and I would argue not good for anyone in particular, including America. The last point about ASEAN, I think, is that the critical part will be for Biden to think through how his emphasis on the quad and democracy will play out. ASEAN is famously democratically non-democratic. I mean, it's got it in this charter, Democracy and Human Rights. When we look around us, none of us are really very perfect democracies. Uh, you know, and I think that the question mark or how you weigh the geopolitical is issues about building an international order, keeping Asia engagement, sort of you know, competing with China with your friends versus emphasizing those values, democracy, human rights will need to be played out. And the second element, which Nirmal mentioned, was comfortable to play Australia, Japan, and perhaps India, as Kanti has said. But if you play only those and emphasize that quad, then what happens to ASEAN? And do you set up a tension between these two initiatives? Let me move on to climate change and use an illustration of the chop and change in America and the need to build institutions. I think Simon Chesterman put it very well. We really have to deal with new issues in a new way. America is still the leading country of the world, but the world is changing. And America's position in the world is changing and got to deal with it. Climate change is a particular example of this. No one country can solve it. America, though, cannot seem to make up its mind. You go back a little bit further to Bush and then to Obama and then to Trump. You can see the cycle of belief joining, not joining, and literally the date of which Trump's uh, legal uh, uh, withdrawal from Paris Agreement occurred just before the count started. So really, I think this demonstrates that America needs to find some consistency. Now, again, going back to that deep current, I'm very happy to say that companies in America, cities in America, many states in America get it. Now, exactly what to do with climate change, they haven't quite figured it out, but they're actually well positioned to make an energy and other transitions and be a leader in many of the technologies and services that the world will need to be carbon neutral. America can do it. The question is whether they're minded to. Broadly speaking, I think Biden's attempt to come back into uh, climate change will face resistance from certain sectors and uh, uh, industries in America. But there's hope for America to come in with more commitment and that for strong current pro-climate issues to be surfaced. My last point on this is to go back to the rules idea. I think really what has discomforted a lot of us in national law and in the law school where I'm with uh, Simon Chesterman is that this competition with China and broadly speaking America first has been a question of playing by the rules or playing outside the rules. Now there are areas where new rules are needed like technology and really there will be a lot of competition and conflict there. But again, negotiating a regime is different from insisting on your way unilaterally. I think hopefully Biden will realize, is admins, will realize that America has helped build the international system. There's no reason why America cannot lead the modification of the international system, whether in the WHO, the WTO, the climate change regime, or the new rules we need technology to really lead and make America great again, but not spelt with G-R-A-T-E. All right, thank you. You, sh you should trademark that soundbite, uh, Simon, or, or write it out. But uh, thank you very much for that. So what I'd like to do now is come back to each of the panelists with just one question from me, and then I, I see some, some very good questions from our audience coming in the Q&A function. Please, please do add to them. Uh, and panelists, in addition to responding to my question, um, feel free to respond to other things that have been said thus far. But Normal, I'd, li I'd like to come to you because um, I mean, you're based, I said earlier, this is a breakfast seminar. Of course, it's evening for you in Washington. Uh, and thank you for, for staying on uh, to be part of this discussion. But I am just fascinated what it's been like covering um, the, the administration, uh, the, the, the interesting administration in particular, but also just how important you think the issues we're discussing are likely to be in the day-to-day -day politics of Washington. Um, because uh, as I said at the outset, Many of us around the world would like US presidential elections to be decided based on foreign policy, but of course that's not what happens. So one, what, what's it like covering 
foreign policy uh, and issues relevant to Asia in Washington at the moment and how is that likely to change? Uh, and two, how important is that discussion? How important is politics to determining uh, the foreign policy of the United States? Or is there this kind of institutional view, uh, which is something I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to Tina on uh, in a moment. Yeah, well, I'd mentioned, and I think I'd mentioned that the Trump administration has sort of veered into, am I, are you hearing me? Yes. Um, has sort of veered into um, demonization of China, which has been an, an unfortunate fallout of the campaign. And uh, if you go, I've gone out to, to cover Trump rallies, pre-election Trump rallies, and uh, it's China virus, China virus, the Chinese did this, the Communist Party did this and all that. And they give, they give President Trump a pass. These are, of course, Trump supporters, right? It's, it's like two alternative realities in America at the moment, unfortunately. And as a journalist covering this, it's very tough because you have to navigate these two rea alternative realities and, 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 and look for evidence that both uh, may have you know, for their points of view. So it's been remarkably difficult. Um, as also all the information environment, as we know, is just, you know, it's uh, like a blizzard of misinformation, really, more than information. But um, foreign policy otherwise, as we know, does not, does, not for, does not figure very large among the electorate. And if it does, it's very simplistic. But in, uh, in DC, yes, absolutely, there is this, uh, there is a, consensus, I would say, in the national security establishment about the strategic threat of China that goes back a while, right? Um, so that has been consolidated. Um, climate change is very divisive. I think that uh, climate change has the, the, from, you know, it's plain to see that the current administration basically doesn't believe that it's something we should worry about um, or that or to more, put it more specifically, that humans are driving it and anthropogenic climate change, they you know, not, don't subscribe to that really. So um, we see a, a change in that, but then, you know, as uh, I think it was Simon or uh, may, who may have mentioned it, there will be resistance internally in the US from a large, large sectors of, the, of industry. Uh, there will be, resistance, you know, I'm asked continually, will a Joe Biden administration look at rejoining the uh, TPP or, or, or the TPP, you know, plus 2.0 that we have? I, he still has to contend with a vast swath of the American public who doesn't want it. So he's not going to be this untrammeled globalist. He can't afford to do that. Um, yeah, well, that's short comment. I don't know if it's helpful. Well, no, as, as, and as someone who occasionally myself contributes to the Straits Times, I must confess I'm a bit disappointed the Straits Times was never denounced as fake news, but um, perhaps there's still time for that. Um, Tina, Tina, can I turn to you? Because um, as Nirmal was just highlighting sure. uh, about the divisions in the United States, I mean, we've all seen that um, President-elect Biden has the biggest mandate of any president in American history, but the second largest number of people who voted for any American president have voted for four more years of President Trump. Um, now, in your presentation, in your, your opening remarks earlier, I think you were trying to highlight the degree of continuity that there is in US foreign policy. How do you see that continuity in the context of this <coughs> uh, divisions, the divisions within the United States, and uh, these aren't entirely partisan, Nirmal's um, observation about the, uh, the protectionism Correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. in the US uh, is, is something that is not limited to the Republican Party. And indeed, it used to be the opposite. Um, so could you talk a bit about continuity and change, please, in, in this context? And and if you want a response to anything that Steve said earlier, uh, given that he spoke after you, feel free to respond to that as well. No, yeah, well, um, one of the things is China actually has been a bad actor in the United States actively over the last seven years with the United States media and both diplomatic parties finding that China did um, hack the US, has um, attacked US business and reappropriated patents 
Um, you know, in the United States more recently, they've sh you know, there's been many stories of Chinese students coming out as spying on behalf of the Chinese government, whether these are true or not. There is absolutely a large push on behalf of the United States to show that China in itself has is, is an adversary to the United States. So from a foreign policy standpoint, I agree with Nirmal completely that whether it's a Republican or Democratic administration, we can't ignore the, the, the public in the United States as well as the government in the United States cannot ignore the um, security risks to the United States that China presents having to do with technology and also just the espionage side of what China has done in the United States over the last um, eight to 10 years. It's, it's unfortunate that um, these things have come to light, but you know, as China's growing and they, they've reached out very hard to engage with the United States, Sometimes the tactics aren't exactly the right way that the United States democratic process would like. And I think that this has been brought to the forefront in American politics, in, a, in American normal conversation around a dinner table. It's dinner table conversation actually in the United States. So it does make it quite difficult for the Biden administration to sort of step out of pressure on China and uh, yeah, a lot of pressure on China. Thanks very much. Um, so, Steve, can I can I turn to you now? Because um, I suppose two questions. One, how hard can a Biden administration push China? Uh, and indeed, I see there's a, a question in the in the Q and A function about um, the human rights situation, the Uyghur situation, for example. Um, but also, you were talking earlier about how there is um, prospects of the, the U.S. Um, returning to hu human rights being more important. Parliament of Democracies or a meeting of democracies, to what extent uh, are there limits on the high ground, the moral high ground that the United States can assert, given <clears throat> some of the activities over the last several years, but in particular in the context of a democracy, uh, if there is the possibility that I mean, President Trump might never concede loss uh, in this election, uh, and to what extent that limits the US ability to promote democracy around the world? You know, let me like, take that one first. And, and I do want to say to Simon Tay, I am absolutely stealing that line about how President Trump has made America great from a foreign policy perspective. I'll give you credit the first time I use it. After that, I'm going to own it, though. Make a donation to the SIA. <laughs> Carry on. I'll do, a, I'll do another session for SIA. We'll, we'll call it even. Um, uh, oh, look, uh, Donald Trump does not have to concede under, under U.S. law. He will not be president come January 20th, full stop. It is irrelevant what he does. And so the United States goes forward with, with President Biden and Vice President Harris. And I don't think personally that Im it impacts the United States uh, standing in the world if Donald Trump uh, continues to tweet from Mar-a-Lago or his golf course in Scotland or, or Trump Tower in New York, wherever he happens to, uh, to be. So the United States goes forward. We're, we're going to have a bumpy two months. We're going to have uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of you know, untruths when it comes to fraud and, and, and all of that. But it, it, look, a year from now, no one's going to remember that, that two-month period. So the United States is going to move forward, and it's going to move forward with the standing that it will have under a Biden-Harris administration, not what happens uh, is as ugly as it may be uh, for the next uh, two months. I think I said in terms of trade, the, the, it is going to be very difficult uh, where you are going to have to continue to confront China where it needs to be confronted. Um, and, and that is on all of those unfair trade practices. Now, what can happen here and, and where I think a huge uh, miscalculation that the, the Trump administration made was that a lot of the changes that the United States seeks in China are in China's interest too. China now has a lot of intellectual property. It needs to protect its own intellectual property, not just steal um, from foreign companies anymore. So getting a reformation of, of the intellectual property regime in China is not just in the US interest and in Singapore interest and in, you know, in, in everybody, in the EU's interest, it's in China's interest too. But, but the Trump approach of bullying China with unilateral tariffs did not get China to get there. He, they didn't give Trump, they didn't give, China, Trump didn't give Xi a win-win. And so you're gonna see a different approach where you can make progress um, on trade. And at the same time, and this is gonna to be tough, you are going to still confront them when need be. 
human rights is going to be one of those uh, elements. Uh, national security is going to be one of those elements. And how you can move on those two tracks simultaneously and not allow China to, to bargain one off from the other is going to be tough. And I think Conti mentioned this in his opening that you know, India is a little bit concerned. Well, is the Biden administration going to stay as tough on China as need be on those areas where it's deserved? Um, I think the answer is yes, but you're right, Connie. That is, it's something that the Biden administration is going to have to prove. I was very heartened to see that one of the first people to congratulate, uh, you know, President-elect Biden was Prime Minister Modi. Uh, you know, and, and so that shows, you know, there is that working relationship that's going to continue with U.S.-India. Um, under a Biden administration um, as well. Uh, but I think the moral standing the United States has is not necessarily that, that we don't recognize we have a lot of issues to deal with when it comes to racial inequality, when it comes to income inequality, when it comes uh, to all of the, you know, the, the police reforms that are needed. But if the United States is making the right case on human rights, um, and and is is backing that up and in a multilateral fashion that is going to be part of, of foreign policy for everybody to deal with and businesses and investors are going to have to take that into consideration they're going to have to start looking deeper into their supply chain to make sure um, there is responsible sourcing uh, they're going to have to take climate more and more into their uh, business and investment decisions like like the monetary authority in Singapore here is requiring asset managers to do when it comes to climate risk. So it's a new day. Some of it is going to be government driven. Some of it is going to be um, stakeholder driven. Thanks very much. I mean, it is. So, um, Professor, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead uh, uh, Professor, if you don't mind, um, Steve, I also think it's very important to mention that our European allies in 2019 did come on um, and engage with the administration uh, prior to the COVID crisis. And there was cohesive working with our European allies on many of the issues that you've talked about. Now, I will um, say climate change was not one of those issues, but human rights issues, technology issues, all of these issues, the European Union did come on board with the Trump administration, create a strategy and a plan towards addressing those with China, with both the United States implementing their policies and the EU themselves also implementing policies. So while while COVID did interrupt um, the strategies that were being put into place on behalf of global communities and allies. Um, it's good that there's a foundation been established if President Biden takes his office that he can step into because there's already a structure been put in place on behalf of the Trump administration in many key areas, not including climate change. I would just say when President Biden takes office, not if. Okay. Uh, on Simon okay. Tang, you wanted to come? Can I just jump in on the uh, points that were raised in the question and answer, some of them about uh, South China Sea, which we haven't hardly mentioned. Um, um, first, I think uh, some context. I, I'm afraid I'm a bit more pessimistic than Steve Okun about the next two months. Um, I mean, a lot of things can happen which could undermine America's uh, projection of its uh, ability to govern well at home and uh, therefore succeed abroad. Uh, my greatest fear is the pandemic, as well as perhaps civil unrest. Uh, there's already been some clashes and it never, it does worry me that it could grow. Uh, but I think that whatever it is, America's presence in the region is gonna be uh, a, a perennial. Um, the late Lee Kuan Yew always talked about it as a status quo power. And it'd be lovely to see America returning to some of that status quoism other than being kind of, uh, you know, turbulent power. Um, here in the South China Sea, I think if we go to a local lens of history, uh, we realize that in 2010, you know, when I wrote my last book about America and Asia relations, there was no real spike of South China Sea issues. Now, there's no turning back the clock, but I think this demonstrates that the problem can be managed. It necessarily can't be solved because China has certain legitimate concerns about its own security, the seas, so near its own coastline. But I think they can be managed in a way that allows freedom of navigation and space for the Southeast Asian countries, as well as the other countries, including Japan and Korea, and of course the USA and Singapore, which use the seas as the vital links of communication. But there's no rewinding the clock to where it was before. On that, there was another question about Singapore and our relations with America in terms of the base that we have. First, 
clarify, we have no bases here, we have places. Uh, we have, under the Trump administration, the Singapore government, uh, Mr. Lee uh, San Lung was one of the few ASEAN leaders who met with Mr. Trump last year and has agreed to a 15-year extension. So it doesn't mean to wait for Biden. America is a perennially important to Singapore, and Singapore has engaged with broadly, whether Democrats or Republicans, whatever administration, we have no vote, as you said earlier in the introduction, Simon. So we deal with whoever comes. And I think this would continue. But I do think that all this China talk, one thing that see, I see from an ASEAN and Singapore point of view is that not just the China threat or the China rule breaking or the China assertive or aggressive behavior, we have to see the China opportunity. The pandemic, which you know Simon Chesterman is tired of talking about, is a reality that's hard baked into the situation here. And the growth numbers coming out of China are the only ones that are really driving through the region. Yeah. Um, and the DHL, et cetera, you know, American companies are part of the beneficiaries from this boom we see, relative boom we see in China. And I think this part of the equation can also need to be talked about in kind of finding ways to win-win, to use rather old language, in a global system. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. And, and for the, the panelists and indeed the attendees, I'll, I'll, I appreciate you um, answering some of the questions in the q and I'll come back to those uh, other Q&A uh, questions. Please keep them coming in uh, for our attendees. Uh, I just want to get Kanti to weigh in on one thing, and then I'll, I'll come back with some of those additional questions. Because uh, Kanti, this follows on, on nicely from, from Simon Tay's comments about China. Um, you, you talked a bit about uh, the return to international institutions. Uh, and I had a question about China and about India. Uh, on China, in addition to the um, uh, sort of tensions that have uh, emerged uh, just recently, for example, in my own native Australia, we have the first prosecution of an individual for uh, foreign interference, uh, a, a Chinese national in Australia. Um, you mentioned the, the importance of international institutions. It's striking that international institutions hate a vacuum. Uh, and it's uh, somewhat surprising if one looks at the history of China from uh, its initial ostracization by the UN until it, uh, rejo until it Beijing joined the UN in 1971, um, and, uh, and you saw a slow rise of China. For a long time, China kept a very low profile. Um, but now, four of the 15 specialized agencies of the United Nations are headed by Chinese nationals. China has the largest peacekeeping presence of all five permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, so to what extent do you think China has already sort of shifted global uh, institutions in its favor? Uh, to what extent can America catch up? And what role do you see for India? Because India, um, I think it was under Obama uh, that the United States supported, in theory at least, a veto for India as a permanent member of the Security Council. There's been no concrete action actually to get India on the Security Council. Uh, so what, what role, I suppose, do you see for India itself as a, as a global power uh, and uh, the, the relative role that the United States can and should play itself, uh, either from an Indian perspective or, or more generally? Yeah, let me be as quick as I can, because I, I know there are questions uh, piling up uh, from, from the audience. Um, on international institutions, I think it's true that um, China has really made inroads, and, and you gave us some background and detail on that. Um, and I think Delhi will be looking for America to make a, a comeback there. Um, but there are a couple of things that are worrisome. Um, there's a very nice piece in Foreign Affairs by uh, William Burns on how much the State Department has been hollowed out in, in, in the United States over the last four or five years. But going back a little further, um, I mean, if the United States is going to make a comeback in international institutions, uh, it needs a reinvigorated State Department uh, that's going to bring expertise, that knows how to work the corridors and, and the green rooms and the meetings and so on. Um, so I think one of the things that it'll be interesting to watch is to what extent um, the State Department is going to be rehabilitated under Biden. Uh, I think he's promised to do that. And... Uh, it'll be an important indication of how much America is going to come back into international institutions. But I think uh, also that you know the, uh, China has not only made a play into the normal kind of established institutions, but it's uh, set up a whole bunch of institutions of its own. I mean, from the BRI uh, to the AIIB uh, to the New Development Bank uh, of the BRICS and so on. So. 
Um, you know, there um, it's not clear how much uh, America can kind of check uh, and balance those. Uh, it's mostly stayed aloof from them, frankly. Um, so I think the, there's quite a challenge for the United States uh, uh, ahead in terms of, of dealing with these institutions. And just a word on domestic politics in, in the US. I mean, uh, all it, to the extent the, the Americans make a, a return in these institutions, got to keep an eye on domestic politics. Um, how much uh, a Republican uh, uh, controlled Senate will constrain uh, a, a back to the table kind of Biden on climate change or trade and and, and so on. So uh, I think it, it, it Biden's going to try, uh, but it, it won't be all that easy to check growing Chinese influence and power and positioning in international institutions. India wants, uh, India is going to be a permanent, uh, not a permanent member, I'm sorry, a, a member of the UN Security Council, uh, voted in uh, for the next couple of years. Um, so it's a crucial moment for India to, to sort of step forward a bit more. I don't think Delhi expects even a Biden administration to be able to really overcome a Chinese veto on India's membership as a permanent member uh, in the future. So uh, Delhi has no great hope of, of making that leap into permanent membership anytime soon, frankly. Um, on, um, um, I think I'll just stop there. I think those are the, the, the key points. On just a, another quick word on, on China. I mean, the United States, um, has never supported India on the border question beyond the point. Um, and so um, this is a point that you know Delhi will be watching, be watching to see how much Biden uh, will shift American policies towards a more outright supportive view of India's claims on the border. Um, and uh, so, so let's see, I, I, I think um, uh, that'll be a key test. Thanks, Kanti. Okay, so I, I do want to now turn to some of the very good questions that have been coming in uh, and, and start with um, two that, uh, that uh, a couple of people have commented on. One is technology and the other is Taiwan. So on technology, um, so social media obviously played a huge part in President Trump's election. It's become a source of tension, uh, both in terms of the content on social media, but also um, as a, as a proxy in some ways for the importance of technology globally. And Steve, I think you highlighted the, the coming fights with 5G uh, um, where there's a, a real prospect of the internet, which was meant to bring us all together, uh, both dividing us yeah. metaphorically in terms of the fights that go on on the internet, but also potentially, literally, uh, if we have a bifurcated internet uh, through some of the underlying architecture. So I'll, I'll Pause that as one question. Uh, and then secondly, uh, a few people asked about Taiwan, which of course is uh, one of the most potentially dangerous uh, issues in the event that um, there was a military confrontation between uh, the US and China. Taiwan is one of the likely uh, focal points. Uh, if uh, any of you are willing to, uh, to address whether there would be any shift or what, the, what a Biden administration's position on Taiwan would be. But I'll throw those two out, maybe Steve, push you on the, on the 5G question first, and then anyone else who wants to come in on either of these two issues. I'm gonna broaden out the technology uh, question a bit. Uh, it, you know, the, this whole thing is, you know, is, is there decoupling going to occur on, on technology? Look, the, the decoupling has occurred. China did the decoupling on, on, on technology. I've gone to China for, for many, many years. I can't use WhatsApp. I can't use Facebook. I can't use Twitter. I can't get on YouTube. Why? Because China has decoupled. So it was China that decoupled. And now you're starting to see the question of where the, I think the, the Trump administration has gone and, and has conflated things. And this is what the Biden administration is going to have to deal with, which is one, there's the national security aspects of technology. When you can show right, that, that there is a national security issue when it comes to technology uh, in investment or technology access to the United States or US networks, then you have to cut it off for national security reasons. And, and that will certainly continue under, under the Biden administration. Um, that, that national security and technology is here to stay. But the other issue is what happens on the unlevel playing field when it comes to technology. Why is it that US companies can't use the cloud in China, but Alibaba can use 
the cloud in the United States. Why? So where is the reciprocity going to come into this? The Trump administration has not addressed that yet. Um, uh, certainly previous administrations hadn't because it wasn't the issue then, but it's, it's coming to the fore now. So I think that is a real thing to watch on, on as this plays out. And you can see, you know, you know the bats, right? So let's take out SoftBank. So the bat, right? Uh, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. If they're not going to have access to the U.S. market, they're going to have to find other markets to expand to. So you see a lot of uh, Chinese tech companies some setting up international platforms here in Singapore because they're looking for those new markets. But what happens if there are going to be sanctions on those companies, if they're national security threats. So a lot of things are going to be in flux and, and that are going to be a real challenge for the Biden administration. Again, not, not should we decouple. The decoupling has occurred. Not that, well, should there be reciprocity? There isn't reciprocity. Does reciprocity now become part of the technology issues between China uh, and the world? And you're not going to see a Biden administration, you know, you know, say, well, TikTok or WeChat get access to the U.S. market if they make a $300 million donation to an education foundation in Texas. That's not how you do uh, trade and technology and national security. That is certainly going to change. But I, it's time to answer your questions. I mean, it is something that is going to be very difficult to play out, and it's going to be something the U.S. cannot do unilaterally, and it's going to be have to, it's going to have to be done multilaterally. You see what India is doing on on social media in China, um, but it can't work on a, on a unilateral basis. Everybody's going to have to come together on this. Thanks, um, Kanti. Do you want to come in on that, and then uh, anyone on Taiwan? Yeah, no, just to say that uh, uh, Steve's right. I mean, India has banned uh, over a hundred uh, Chinese apps. Um, and um, on uh, Chinese investment, I mean, uh, quite a lot of it went into the uh, startup sector, and it has uh, uh, put constraints on that as well, um, saying that you know th those will be up for very close scrutiny by the foreign ministry and and um, other institutions in India before they uh, they can be approved. Um, there was an Indian worry about Chinese takeovers of uh, companies that were uh, having difficulties during uh, the COVID uh, period, Indian companies that were kind of ripe for acquisition and India's uh, put limits on, on Chinese investments uh, in, in those areas as well. So I think um, India has kind of gone a, a, a decoupling way. And um, again, Delhi will be watching quite closely how Biden deals uh, uh, you know, with, with these issues. Just one thing on, on uh, uh, India's got to make a decision on 5G as well. So I think it'll be looking to coordinate quite closely with, uh, with, uh, with Biden uh, on that. And uh, on the, the one uh, the different um, position that India might take is that, you know, I think in India has some worries about the role of governments in, in controlling the internet and, and, and so on. And I think there, there are tensions with uh, the United States. I mean, the Indian government's been pretty uh, aggressive in demanding that um, American and other service providers share data and information with the Indian government. And I think, you know, there have been some tensions with Washington over that, and that might continue. If I could jump in, Simon, on, Taiwan and tech. on tech quickly, I want to agree with uh, Steve Okun that we really need multilateral rules. And I think the situation here in ASEAN is one where uh, we're kind of facing a digital divide because both the Chinese companies have come in, but the American companies are very strong here and have, in fact, reinvested in Singapore. So I think it can work out, but a lot will have to do with the ability to agree on certain areas. And one thing I'm watching, and I'm, I think I'd like to learn more about this, is Singapore's own initiatives on the digital economy agreements is doing bilaterally with Australia and other countries. Whether these small countries can uh, start to build up some bedrock of rules just as uh, Singapore, in a way, helped pave the way for the TPP with the P4 way back when. So I think this multilateralism among Asian countries is important to watch. Uh, the second part about Taiwan, um, I'm a great fan of Taiwan, but I must say that the Trump administration has been quite uh, too friendly. It's been really encouraging them to really step out beyond the normal, so much so that it's almost been provocative, uh, some of the actions that Taiwan has taken and statements they made over things like Hong Kong. Uh, no, really felt that with the Trump uh, sort of, uh, umbrella, they would not be uh, uh, subject to any sort of pressures from China. I'm hoping that Taiwan, in this sense, will take the occasion to return to some sort of normal. I mean, 
it has caused Beijing's problem also that they do not want to talk to the Tsai Ing-wen uh, administration. And Madam Tsai has won her second term very strongly, shows a lot of leadership. I think the time has come for uh, these two countries to start at least uh, party to party or other uh, tracks of discussion to alleviate the, the danger that provocation will be used by, by Taiwan. Under Trump, in a way, I, I thought that uh, Trump had a Taiwan card, or maybe Taiwan had a Trump card. Um, but I think that now we will try to hopefully steer back to something more stable and normal. The problem won't go away. The situation won't go away, but we can manage it. So thanks, Tom. Tina, if I can come to you on this, uh, both the substance, but also underlying this is really a question of style and disposition, because without, I mean, insofar as you feel comfortable, one of the attractions of President Trump for many who voted for him appears to have been precisely that he was not the normal, that he was not going to be a status quo president. There was clearly a desire on some people on this part of some people for change, and clearly that's that's still got a large, significant number of people in the United States who who want not the return to normality that many of us have been commenting on here, but but some kind of change. Uh, and one one analysis early on in his presidency was that this is partly uh, linked to his relative inexperience in Washington, as opposed to a very establishment person like Joe Biden, uh, that President Trump's experience as a real estate developer, for example, meant that he was a deal maker, but a deal maker in contexts where you either got to build the development, so you win 100%, or you get nothing. Uh, and that this has been reflected in some of his foreign policy, that you have big gambles, like with uh, North Korea, that could either pay off handsomely or nothing happens, uh, and, and that that's, uh, that's one of the criticisms of his behavior, but it was also one of the attractions that you had this sort of willingness not to just follow the safe line, not to just stick with the status quo, but to try and push change, to try and bring about a more radical agenda. So would you, if you're comfortable, comment on that sort of style question, as well as any of the substantial issues where uh, either in technology, Taiwan, or other, uh, the other topics that we've, uh, we've been discussing? I'm sure uh, the adjectives that you used are interesting um, because my take, and I want you to know, not only am I chairman of Republicans Overseas here, but Republicans Overseas is officially part of the RNC. So I receive all the information that RNC delegates receive and with regards to the Republican platform and what's important to Republicans in the United States. Um, something that I think it's important for your, your, your listeners to, to hear about is that Americans actually didn't look at Donald Trump because he was a real estate developer or that he was going to talk about massive change. That's not a narrative that most generally Republicans were looking at. What Republicans really voted for Donald Trump was to return to more traditional values. And when I mean traditional values, I mean socially traditional values. There was a large push during the Obama administration in his last uh, three years in the administration to really take... Um, changes to the, to the fabric of the social structure in the United States, your personal freedoms, what affected you personally with regards to practicing your religion, what a practice, what, you know, whether your business was, were affected if your religious freedom was challenged. These were much more substantive issues as to what Americans that felt that their personal freedoms, their own personal freedoms were threatened. And that's why you saw quite uh, you know, the support for when it wasn't necessarily just America first, that's a big concept. And while um, those of us that are on a global scale, we understand that big concept, what it more meant and what he really talked about in his rallies when he was talking to the American people was about bringing tradition back to and bringing control back into their own lives over their own where government was impacting their lives, whether it was in schools and at what age sex education could be brought into schools, like in second grade, and people went crazy about that. So there was a lot of policies that the Obama administration socially brought into the American community. It's a it's a divide, you know. That's a that's the sweet spot in the in American politics where the vote really stands. You've seen that we have um, liberal positions. We have, uh, you know, you can see the two parties in the United States. They're not arguing about foreign policy issues. They're arguing about social issues and on top of, along with climate change. So it, it was not um, it was not about him being a real estate developer and shaking things up and America first on a global scale, because in general, America first didn't really affect the general public of the United States. He was elected because he was talking about giving us our personal freedoms back. And people, um, you know, 
they responded to that. And I personally, um, I was born in California. Um, I'm a Reagan Republican. I'm from Santa Barbara, California, where the Reagan Ranch is located. Um, I was born with conservative principles. And for me, um, I'm not really comfortable with some of the things where our country has pushed the edges. And President Trump just basically said to the American people, OK, let's bring it back. And let's slowly move these changes through the social structure of the United States. Let's not just um, force it on half or three quarter, you know, all of the population where half or more of the population is like, wait, 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 I'm not ready for that. So I think that's um, a most important. I know that's not an international response, but that is the domestic side of why um, President Trump um, was put into position. You know, I think it's very important for us to also realize that for technology, this is important just for Asia. Um, Australia, Japan, and the United States have signed an agreement with each other in 2019 to work together on technology infrastructure with $1 trillion pledged on behalf of all three countries. And my hope is that the Biden administration, if again, I say if, Steve says is, um, administration is going to be put in, that those policies are still followed under that agreement. So that's a 2019 agreement that was already signed between these three countries to work cohesively together on the 5G issue, 5G issue in Asia um, to, to address uh, this competition with China. Thanks, thanks, Tina. And and I, I completely accept your point about the, the conservative in that sort of traditional sense of the word uh, appeal of Donald Trump at a time when many people thought it was changed, thought the world was changing a bit too fast. Um, but there is an international dimension, and indeed there's a question in the chat about Islamophobia, uh, because much as I think probably the vast majority of people who voted for Donald Trump are not racist, his willingness to use racist language, inflammatory language, uh, to refuse to denounce um, avowed, self-avowed racists has been troubling, obviously within the United States, uh, but also internationally. Uh, so you, you can you can have a response to this if you like. Uh, but the question sure. was uh, to what extent uh, we will see a change in uh, uh, growing Islamophobia in the West generally, which is clearly not confined to the United States. Uh, and so uh, maybe framing it as a question: how we see the future relations with uh, with um, Islam. Uh, on the part of the United States, both within the United States, because America has a, a very large Muslim population itself, uh, as well as internationally. Well, I think that the messaging at the very beginning, thank you for that question as well. I think that the messaging in the very beginning, when we were talking about visas and um, you know the, the shutting down of immigrants coming to the United States was incorrect, and um, also was not actually what the policy was. I think that the messaging was far louder than what the policy was. I think it's important for people to know the United States is not Islamophobic. The United States supports its Islam partners around the world. And I just personally, I'd like you to know, my husband's from India. I have four um, brown skinned children. So discussing racism and otherwise, I'm also very sensitive to the fact when those conversations take place with regards to the Republican party. Um, having to do with, uh, you know, the peace agreements, let, okay, let's go back to the first, the first thing. In the United States, when those travel bans were put on, the policies that were put in place there specifically had to do with the infrastructure that countries at war, which happened to be Islamic countries mostly, had in place to be able to vet their people that were going to be coming to the United States. I know we don't like to talk about that to get down into the nuts and bolts of actually what the policy said, but that's what the policy was about. So in the end, it was the infrastructure based on countries that didn't have that current infrastructure to provide security, uh, security uh, confidence to the United States for people traveling from Islamic countries. As you have seen through the Trump administration the last three years and four years, um, his engagement with the Islamic world has been profound. And the, the, the peace agreements that he's been able to put in place with Israel and the work that's been done um, quietly behind the scenes with the Trump administration um, in the Islamic world are, uh, you know, are, are wonderful. And it's great that we're being able to create these agreements um, to create more stability for our ally Israel and also peace in the Middle East. One thing I'd like to address having to do with the pressure on Iran, it is because the pressure is in, on Iran that these agreements have been able to be established, my belief and the Republican belief, 
between these Islamic countries in the Middle East and the United States. Obviously, we are all aware there are different pressures within the Islamic region, within the Middle East region, between countries. And the pressure on Iran and the, the pulling out of the Iran deal did provide additional conversation for the Trump administration to engage with other partners in the Middle East to create these type of peace deals and create these type of allegiances. So I think it's important that when we talk about strategy, that strategy is completely explained to the people, you know, to our constituents that are listening. It's not just that the U.S. pulled out of the Iran deal and, you know, Middle East was happy about that. There was a lot of support on behalf of Middle East allies for the United States to pull out of that Iran deal. Thanks, Tina. Uh, those of you who are watching this thinking about moderating your own panels, please note, do not start a conversation about Islam and the West when you've only got five minutes to go. But, uh, but thank you for those comments. <laughs> yeah. um, it's good. There's a lot more we could say. Uh, we are going to have to wrap up, uh, and I'll let, I'll let each of our panellists have maximum 60 seconds. If you would like something to frame your remarks, one of the, one of the things that I find uh, fascinating in this context is that small countries... Uh, like Singapore, but not limited to Singapore, uh, do not really want to have to choose between countries like the United States and China. Uh, but if you had been asked 20, 30 years ago to choose unquestionably, your political and largely economic ties would have led you to go with the United States. Today, if forced to choose, it would be much harder because many countries have strong political security ties with the United States, but their economic interests lie with, with China. So if you would like that as a framing uh, for a final comment, please take it up. But otherwise, um, I'll go in uh, reverse order through our panelists uh, in the direction that they opened with uh, with Simon Tay uh, coming in first, uh, then Kanti, then Steve, then Tina, and then Nirmal, you'll get the second last word. Thank you, Simon Chesterman. Uh, in one minute, I think first of all, my want to echo three hopes for, for the US in, in top Tommy Costa. Uh, first, I think for the US domestically. Uh, while I was worried about the transition next few months, uh, President-elect Biden has talked about ruling for all, whether red state or blue state, he says he'll be president of the United States. Let's hope he doesn't uh, renege on that and there will be no more cult less cultural warfare, which what Tina referred to. The second is that uh, the change and reaction. The world is changing as a number of us have emphasized. And I think not just this presidency, but the three presidents before have had to grapple with that changing world and how America finds its position in a more multilateral world. The third is that I still have great hope that some avenues of working together can be found. There will be areas of competition conflict with China, but America can find meaningfully areas of working together on climate, which I emphasized during the time, China is committed to carbon neutral by 2060 or 2050. And the second area most immediately is the WHO and the search for a vaccine. America helped start China's uh, immunization centers, and they actually have worked together at that level throughout all the earlier problems with SARS and Ebola, et cetera. Why not again? The world needs it. And that leads me to the last point, either or. Simon, I'm old enough to have lived through the transition from the UK-centric world in Singapore face to the US. I think we have positioned ourselves today a more multilateral world in which China will play a bigger part. It will have a more uh, legitimate interest that we all have to recognize. The coming months particularly will show this as China is the one that seems struggling, recovering most strongly from the, from the pandemic, whereas other parts of the world are still struggling. But I do believe that uh, small states can have a role in multilateralism and help build up this multilateral world. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Kanti. Yeah, I think uh, a lot will depend uh, in the years ahead with Biden on domestic politics. I mean, he has worked the system and worked in the system for years. He's very, very experienced, unlike Trump, uh, in that respect. And he has a pretty good uh, relationship with Mitch McConnell, and they could strike up a partnership. But I think a lot will turn on, even in the foreign policy realm, on how well Biden deals with uh, Congress and, and the Senate in particular, and Mitch McConnell and, and, and those folks. So that's my first point. The second is that um, I think on, it's very clear that with Biden as president, the tone will change and there will be a kind of gentler kind of discourse. And so some lowering of temperature for everyone, including with China and in, in, in our region here in Southeast Asia, I think we can expect that. Uh, 
not clear what those will lead to altogether in terms of real outcomes, but the tonality, the temperature, uh, there'll be a more genial uh, kind of tone from the United States. And I think the third is that in terms of these choices, India is not a particularly small country, but I think it's chosen. It's chosen the United States. It's just signed the fourth of four key military agreements, uh, Becca, and uh, it's pretty much uh, put its its cards with the United States at this point in a way that it never has in, in 70 years. And arguably today, India is closer to the United States than it was to the Soviet Union back in the days when uh, the Soviets were almost an ally. So I think uh, India certainly uh, made its choice. Thanks. Steve. Yeah, I think, Conti, there, there's not just going to be a change in tone. There's going to be a change in substance with the Biden administration. And what the Trump administration has done is basically said to countries, you are with us or you are with China. You have to choose. And the Biden administration is going to say, let's get a multilateral engagement. Let's work. Let's do Paris, but Paris plus. It's not just going to come back to Paris. Let's do Paris plus. Let's fix the WTO, which needs to get fixed. Let's come back to the WHO so we can address the pandemic globally, not just say we are only going to have Operation Warp Speed in the U.S. and we're going to hoard all the vaccines until we don't need them anymore. And then that's when we're going to start to share. So you're going to see this multilateralism come back. And then you're going to have countries not have to choose between the U.S. and China, but choose between a multilateral framework and a Chinese-led framework. And frankly, there aren't many Chinese-led frameworks. So you're going to see that shift back towards multilateralism. And hopefully, at the end of the day, what will happen is that China will then have to come into that multilateral framework. China will have to change its trade policies so it can be part of a global trading system as opposed to being outside of it. China will have to change when it comes to climate as opposed to, to saying one thing but doing something else when it comes to all of the coal investments you see coming in on, on Belt and Road and all the pollution that's occurring and all the greenhouse gases are, that are going to get emitted um, on, on, on that front. So that is, that is going to change. Now, look, this isn't going to be easy, but it is certainly in, in countries like Singapore's interest to work within a multilateral framework as opposed to having to choose between the two because a country like Singapore can't. It, it's impossible for them to do that. And I think that's where, not going to go in the first year or two years, but hopefully in, in the first four years of a, of a Biden administration and beyond, you'll, you'll see that change, not just in tone, but in substance. Yeah, just very quickly on that, I, I agree with that point, which is that seconds. China ran away a little bit with the multilateral kind of uh, of uh, you know ownership of, of that. And I think Biden can make a comeback there to show that America's back on multilateralism. Yeah, we, we do need to wrap up. Uh, Tina, please. I'll keep mine short. Um, I think that it's important for everyone to realize that the United States and its allies are already on a multilateral uh, approach to China. There's improvements that can be made to that. But there has been many efforts on behalf of the United States engaging with Asian countries as well as their European allies to create a comprehensive approach to China. Um, my hope is that the Biden administration can add on to what has already been accomplished because it has not been a unilateral option uh, opportunity on behalf of the United States. And those comprehensive agreements that have been put in place will be added on to on behalf of the administration. If the Biden administration takes over and we continue to create multilateral agreements to not necessarily have competition, but to have diplomacy between uh, the United States and its allies and China to create a safer world and a safer Asia. Thank you. Uh, Nirmal. A couple of quick points only very quickly. Uh, I think uh, on the domestic front in the US, we should not underestimate the pressures the US is under internally. Uh, it's a, it's a very risky situation going forward, and I know that you know if one year from now we everything may be all right because uh, the U.S. has such tremendous resilience in its uh, institutions and so forth. But it is really under severe strain now and in the next two months. One should not underestimate that. On the foreign policy front, and specifically China, I think there is also this dilemma, uh, which uh, in the minds of many. Um, how, how do you force a country like China to, to reciprocate this insistence on reciprocity? It's not going to happen. It's just, it, it, the two systems are so entirely different. And yes, yes, put pri uh, pressure on China in terms of the uh, human rights violations, the persecution of the Uyghurs and so forth. 
But do not expect China to suddenly let up on the Uyghurs because the U.S. is pressuring it. It's just unrealistic. So uh, uh, modus vivendi has to be found for coexistence because these two things are completely otherwise incompatible. And um, as for uh, smaller countries um, in, in Southeast Asia, for example, on China's doorstep, I think it's important to remember that uh, they do, I'd like, like what has been mentioned in this panel, they don't want to make a choice. And you know, my analogy is you go to Central America, go to Mexico. They, they love the US for its investment, for rich American tourists and all that. The economy depends on it. But when you talk to the Mexican elites, they all say, we actually wish the US was a little bit further away, right? So I think this, that has a little bit of perspective is required, that's all. Yeah, I think, I think it was a, a Mexican president, was it Porfirio Diaz, who famously famously said, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> Um, yes. So we've, we've run late. I failed in my job as a moderator to keep us to time, but that was because the panelists were so rich in their informative views and we had such great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Um, I'm not going to try and summarize. All I will do is really thank our uh, speakers, um, Nirmal, Tina, Steve, Kanti, Simon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to CIL for organizing this. And thank you to all our participants for giving us uh, your morning or indeed, in Nirmal's case, your evening. Uh, to uh, have this very rich and important discussion. The very last thing I'll say is, uh, Steve, you said in passing that uh, you thought this, this moment of transition will eventually be forgotten, people will be looking forward. I think people will be studying 2020 for decades. I think people will be studying President Trump and what he stands for for decades. Uh, but uh, but that will be for future historians. So I just meant me. I just meant the the, the this two month period of what Trump does to to claim fraud in in all of that. But no, 2020 is going to be the most significant year of our lifetimes. I <laughs> hope because we can't do another one. <laughs> Fingers crossed. All right. Thank you very much, Joel. Back to you. Well, thank you, Professor Chesterman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's event. On behalf of the NUS Center for International Law. We want to express our gratitude to all of the panelists for taking time today to speak at today's webinar. Now to hear more from the Center for International Law, do remember to like, share, and follow our social media pages at Center for International Law. Thank you and have a great day ahead.